We're getting yeah. close. Yeah. Hi, Let's see if I can get my shit together here. Oh, we got two two gentlemen on the on the line here. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you can hear me, I can't hear you yet because I don't have my equipment on. Everyone makes fun of me because I don't have uh, the wireless ear earphones. But ah, no problem. <laughs> no, my fan, my fans make fun of me. My fans make fun of me. They go, Sammy, you can't afford like, you know, iPods or whatever the fuck they're called. And I'm going, I can afford anything. I just don't give a shit about them. So here I am. What's happening, gentlemen? How are you? Uh, are we good? Good. Very good. good. Very good. good to see you. And yeah, I'm see. sorry for to be late, okay? Oh, you're late? No, no, no. no. Oh, oh. Because, no. Yeah, just no, just we're okay. Because, uh, my... Yeah. No, we're okay. No, don't worry about it. I'm uh, I, honestly, I, I've had a really crazy press day because we're announcing my residency in Las Vegas to mo Monday, and I had to do a pre-interview for it. And they, I moved that around to accommodate you. And then when you changed, it butted it up against it. So I just finished with that side. That's when I turned it on a minute ago. I just finished with one oh. interview. So now I'm going to put on a different hat. Now I'm going to put on my book hat. I guess I don't know. Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> The book? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. We're going to talk about everything, okay? Uh, he, uh, Regis is going to make the, the, the introduce, okay? He's going to introduce you in Portuguese, and then we yeah. go on. Okay. All right. I'm, Let's I'm, go. I'm ready to go. I have no, All right. no problem except for hearing. <laughs> I hear you guys now, but if one of these fall out, I'm in trouble. Okay. Okay. There you All go. Right. Here we go. I like your hairdo. Uh, that's, that's what the fuck I need to do to my hair right there. So you just buzz the side and flip, put the top up like this and cut the sides. And then exactly. If not, if, not the white, if not, the whites is coming, you know. So this is the, the good solution. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here I am. Okay. What can I tell you guys? Meus amigos e minhas amigas, em mais um dos nossos papos de boteco, nós temos hoje um dos caras mais legais de todos os tempos. Mr. Sammy Hager, aguarde que nós vamos conversar com ele, a gente vai dar muita risada. Meu amigo e minha amiga, eu vou interromper um pouquinho esse papo, porque eu tenho uma dica maravilhosa para vocês. É um dos livros mais sensacionais abordando o universo do rock and roll e também do empreendedorismo. Eu estou falando de Red, Minha Vida no Rock Sem Censuras, do Sammy Hager. É, exatamente, aquele que foi um dos vocalistas do Van Halen. E em mais de 300 páginas, cara, esse livro traz toda a história do cara desde o início, do, do, dos tempos dele de Montrose, quando ele entrou na carreira solo, que foi uma carreira solo até bem sucedida nos Estados Unidos, aí o estouro mundial com o Van Halen, a formação do Chicken Foot, ele conta tudo isso em detalhes muito divertidos e muito sinceros. Inclusive, o, ele conta como ele se tornou milionário, cara, com aquele negócio dele da, da fábrica de tequilas. E ele conta isso minuciosamente, cara. É um livro muito interessante que você tem que ter aí na sua biblioteca. Ah, e tem um detalhe: a primeira tiragem vem com um kit exclusivo, contendo uma palheta um pôster e um marcador de página. Só que esse kit, ele dura até os estoques chegarem ao final. Depois, já era. Aí é só o livro normal. E é claro que você, meu amigo e minha amiga, que, que segue a gente aqui, você tem privilégios, evidentemente. Se você clicar no link abaixo ou no QR Code aqui na tela e preencher o cupom de desconto com Registadeu Indica, escrito tudo junto, você, ao finalizar a compra, você vai ter 20% de desconto, tá bom? Então não esquece, clica aqui no link abaixo ou no QR Code, não esqueça de preencher o cupom de desconto, Regis Tadeu Indica, escrito tudo junto. 
e na hora de finalizar você vai ter então os 20% de desconto desse livro que é imprescindível para quem adora o rock and roll e quer saber como é que funcionam os negócios, como é que funcionam os bastidores. E tudo isso é contado de uma maneira muito divertida e muito sincera por parte do Sammy Hager. É um livro imperdível, tá bom? Já que eu acabei de dar a dica, agora a gente continua com o nosso papo. Meus amigos e minhas amigas, em mais um episódio do nosso papo de boteco aqui, que eu sempre tenho aqui com o nosso querido Paulo Barão. Olá, Paulo! Tudo bem aí? Fala, Regis. Grande dia para temos... mim, que sou amante de Van Halen, cara. É, nós <risos> temos hoje um dos caras mais legais, é assim, uma grande honra para gente ter um dos caras mais legais do show business. Eu quero uh, ter a honra de bater um papo aqui, nós vamos bater um papo aqui com Mr. Sammy Hager. Welcome! Uh, thank you. Hey, listen, that's a fucking weird intro, because... I couldn't understand a word you were saying. I thought I thought something went wrong with my audio. I thought, uh oh, wait a minute, my, uh, it's trans. Now, what language worry. is this? What language don't, is don't, this? Don't worry. I, I said you were the nicest guy in the show oh. business. Okay. Well, I'll drink to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, it, it's a it's a, a great pleasure to talk with you, uh, Sammy, and I would like to start this interview. This this talk. Uh, I I often say that the the great transformations in our lives are in uh, in little details. For me, you are an example of that. If you had not left Fontana, a small city, and moved it to San Francisco, you probably would not have met. Ronnie Montrose and would not have joined his band. And it was Mont Montrose's first album that got Eddie Van Halen so hallucinated that he introduced himself to you after a, a, a gig at the festival uh, where you and Van Halen performed uh, alongside Black Sabbath and Boston. And then you joined Van Halen as we all know. Did a fact like that make you uh, an, an intuitive guy? Have you used intuition in your own career and even in the act of writing a song or in your own songwriting process? Absolutely. I, I will tell you a million times and I'll tell anybody all of my life we have the power in our, within us to make decisions. I could have said, I'm not going to move to Fontana. I'm not going to move out of Fontana. My mother's, my family's here. I could have stayed there and my whole life would have changed. But something inside of you makes you do things. Or it just, and if you listen to your heart and your mind, uh, my daughter asked me the other day, she said, dad, So how do you know when people, when God is talking through you? How do you know that? How do you know the difference between that voice in your head and what you're really thinking? I said, everything you're thinking is coming from God. Everything is, that comes into your brain. And you have the power to say, I'm going to listen now. I want to do that or I don't want to do that. Uh, it's really a very delicate thing that one little twist, like you said, moving to San Francisco, all this happened. I don't, I have no idea what would have happened if I would have never moved to San Francisco, <laughs> but I had a psychic as you were, were talking about, tell me, move to San Francisco. I go, move to San Francisco. And then I liked what everything she said would happen. So I moved to San Francisco. So sometimes psychic phenomena, tarot cards, astrology, um, um, clairvoyance, you know, um, can help. And, but you got, then you're taking a chance again that somebody might tell you some bullshit and you might do it and fuck everything up. It's, it's really tough. I mean, I, I feel I have angels on my shoulder. Who they are, I don't know. I've never met them, but they certainly whisper in my ear, go ahead, do it, go ahead, do it, go ahead, do it. Because I do shit that people would say, what are you, are you crazy? I'm going, yeah, you know, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to do anything. So, Uh, I think, um, yeah, 
take a chance. I don't know, you know, listen to your heart. I don't know how to do it. I told my daughter, I don't know. It's all coming from God. You just have to figure it out. <laughs> Which message is the one, your insecurity that says, oh, I can't do that. Or God saying you can do it, you know, so. And, and, and did you use this on your songwriting process? Uh, yeah, I must say that some songs, and I think you know which ones they are. If you listen to some songs, you're going, oh, he's just making a song like that up, a song like Dick in the Dirt, you know, uh, or Good Enough, like a Van Halen song. I love that song, Good Enough, right? But it's a made-up song. It's about sex and, and food, you know. It's the same as, you know, putting a steak on the grill or, or putting a girl... <laughs> and get in bed with a chick, you know? So, uh, but the songs that aren't made up, Eagles Fly right now, um, you know, Give the Live uh, songs with Van Halen, like Love Walks In, mm, Dreams. Those songs are not made up. Those songs were just come through me. Best of Both Worlds oh, is a classic example. The song Best of Both Worlds, I, I didn't know what I was writing and Eddie had played me that music. And I'm going on oh, the best of both worlds. And then I thought heaven right here on earth. And then the light came on and I just started writing. There's a picture in a gallery of fallen angel. Look just like, you know, you know just I, I almost couldn't keep up with my hand, with my mind. My hand couldn't keep up with my mind. So, you know, when you let it come through songwriting, um, the best songs are the timeless ones are always the ones that, um, that came from the ether, you know, that you just wrote it down. You didn't think, you didn't stop and try to make a rhyme or nothing. You just fucking write it, write it down. I love that. I have goosebumps on me right now. I don't know if you can see them. My fur is up my legs because that's magic. And you talk about it, you touch it, you feel it, it happens. Right. You know, you know, Sammy, uh, reading your book, uh, I what more amazed me was the amount of things that you have done in your life. <laughs> You've been vocals of the best bands in the world, Montreal, Chicken Fool, Van Halen, Sammy Hagar, The Cycle, Sammy Hagar, The Vaporitas, I, I'm, 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 I'm carry on. But even that, you, have, you are a tequila businessman, you're a bike shopping, uh, a bike shopping, uh, <laughs> come on, you're yeah. the owner of the bars and restaurants, You have your Sammy Beach program. You've been a TV show host. You've been a boxer. And also, you cook well. And you are funny. Come on. <laughs> how you can do that, all these things in your life? Obvious. And also, you look like young. Because probably your life is probably 100 years or 200 years. But oh, 100 at least. Oh, at young. least. <laughs> <laughs> Minimum. Explain, explain me how you do that. You know, when I read my book after writing, I, you know, when I wrote it, I sat with a guy and I did interview, 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 asked me all these questions, just like we're doing now. And I told the stories, told the stories. And then when I read it back after it was all done, the first thing I thought was what you just said. I thought, how the fuck did I do all that shit in one life and not be burnt out? Like I I'm energized by it. Um, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I don't jump off of bridges and bungee cords and out of airplanes. I would never do that shit. I, I want to enjoy my life and not get hurt and <laughs> take a chance. <laughs> But as far as anything else goes, I love doing things that I've never, like I have a, a song that you've never heard. It's, it's just my personal little song. And it has a, a line that says, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And I want to live by that. I want to every day do something for the first time that I've never done. I don't care what it is, the simplest little thing. You know, I, I say, okay, I'm going to make uh, a salsa with all fruits and no, no spice. You know, I'm going to make a, a sweet salsa, you know, whatever. Uh, it, it, it could be anything, but you, I got to push myself at all times to, to do new things. Um, there's something about accomplishments of a dream. You see, this is what drives me. You have a dream. I dreamt that I was Uh, I never dreamt I would make the, you know, the tequila and have such a big uh, um, financial gain from it. I never dreamt that dream. But I dreamt of making the best tequila in the world when I opened the Cabo Wabo. Uh, I never dreamt about going to Mexico and open a business. But then I thought, oh, I went there and said, hey, I wonder if I put a little cantina. So I'm not afraid. So I built this little place. 
make it a cantina, uh, a tequila bar. Of course, it was too big, but that's a good thing now. We all in the books that explains that. But um, then when I got my own tequila, I just wanted to make the best tequila in the world for my business, for, for the Cabo Wobble and for my friends to have. Um, so, but it was a dream to do it, have my own tequila. Wow, Cabo Wobble Cantina, Cabo Wobble Tequila. And then when you accomplish that dream, you get so fucking jacked and you get such a, an insight of energy and ability that you can do anything. I'm serious. I mean, I, I don't, you, me, not just me, you, everybody, we can do anything. We can think of it. If you can dream it and think of it, you can do it. But most people, when they accomplish their dreams, they get too satisfied. Well, something in me will never be satisfied and I'm satisfied, but I'm not. So I live a good life. I'm happy. I'm not uns unsatisfied yet. I'm driven to keep filling up that empty space. And um, I think that when you accomplish a dream, if you bring it into your life and live it, then you are bigger. And then you can chase another dream. But some people just get a dream and then they throw it away and go, oh, I want this now. Oh, I want that car. Oh, I want to fuck that girl. Oh, you know, and then you do it. Oh, no, I want to fuck that girl. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> I hope that metaphor makes it, does it piss somebody off. But yeah, but you know, we chase things. I chase them too, but I try to keep them. You know, if I love that girl, I'm going to marry her <laughs> and I'm a keeper, yeah. you know, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, you know, have things that I want and I keep them. I don't trade them for others. I wrote that in a song right now. We trade in one thing for the other. You know, I don't do that. It, that, that that'll fuck you all up. You'll be chasing this and that. It's like doing cocaine. You know, it's like you do a, a bump of cocaine and what do you want? You want to do another bump. And you know what I mean? You'll never, ever go, oh, well, I don't want another bump now. No, no. You have to say, stop or you're going to kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's life is like that. And I'm not like that. So I don't I don't like to chase things unless I really want it. Right. Uh, uh, your book uh, brings uh, an, an impressive sincerity. Very hard these days. Uh, were there times when writing your memories, you left out of the book any facts or stories that today uh, you would have included or things that you told and later regretted having been publishing? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I forgot so many really fun little things. And every now and then I'll wake up in the morning and have a dream and I'll wake up and it makes me remember something in a childhood. And I think, Oh, I should have put that in the book, you know, but the fucking book would have been this big. So uh, <laughs> uh, you can't do them all, but more than anything, because of the untimely and tragic death of Eddie Van Halen, I apologize from the bottom of my heart for exposing his dark side to where I don't think anyone wants to hear that now. And, and unfortunately it's in the book and it's true. It's all true. It's not like I, I have to say, Oh, I was lying. No, no, no. I just, if I wrote the book today, I would only put the good of Eddie Van Halen because he was such a brilliant genius guitar player and such a great friend and a great partner until everything went wrong, like everything else. Anybody that's been divorced or broke up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, you know how it goes. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's happy endings aren't always the case in a relationship. And Eddie and I did not have a, we had a happy ending, thank God. <laughs> you know, woo, yeah. ching on, you know. But it, if before that, it wasn't a happy, it wasn't a happy um, ending of the band. But thank God we got it back together. But Other than that, no, I think it's it's the right book. I said it all. I should write another one because my life's so freaking crazy that I've done so much between now and then that um, I could write another book. And it would be just as good, just as interesting. I'm not trying to sell everybody on something, but it, it would be just as interesting if I wrote another book because my life is unbelievable. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. I, don't, I, I don't understand it. I don't get it myself, but... I'm happy. I'm ready to go. But, but you know, it's, you know, it's, just... it's important to uh, to expose the dark side because it's a reality. No one knew a lot of that about Eddie, but they'd see him on stage, and they would think, 
why is he acting like that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I would say, well, you should have seen what happened backstage. Yeah. Holy fuck, yeah. you know? Uh, and he really went out. I did, if, if we'd have known he was sick then, then I would have understood. And I would have been a little more, hey, Ed, come on, try to reel him in. But he was impossible. He was on a track of just wild. And so, uh, yeah, it, it was he, tough. He, he becomes a different guy. Yeah. Oh, totally. He was the sweetest guy in the world when I met him. When Eddie Van Halen walked into my dressing room in that show in Anaheim Stadium with Boston and Black Sabbath, um, that was one of the sweetest people, most humble human beings I've ever met in my life. I thought, how can this guy play so badass and be like that humble? I thought, yeah. it's impossible. He, he must have a fire inside of him that he's not showing, you know? And when that fire came out, it was, it was quite the fire. <laughs> like a volcano, a, you know, volcano. Yeah, like, 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 he, like, like he wrote uh, that song, no? Eruption. He wrote yeah. like that. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're telling about the, how amazing things happen in your life. And what really made me think uh, how really incredible was your life was you being visited by two creators inside of, I think, right to it is, right? It was unbelievable. Can you explain me how was that and how does impact your life? Okay, but wait, you broke up. I didn't catch the... the You're, you're breaking yeah, up. Sorry. You, be, you, you claim me be with visit by ship with two creators inside oh. of it, right? Yeah. Right? In the 80s, right? Uh, yeah. I, I would like to, to know how this impact your life, um, how that changed your things in, in your mind. You mean, the, the, you're talking about the aliens, the UFOs? The aliens, the aliens. From outer yeah. space. Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought you said the 80s. So you were breaking up. No, 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 no. Sorry, I'm sorry. The, alien, yeah. the aliens. The aliens. Oh, I'm sorry. The aliens. Oh, fuck. You know, to be honest, I think that not because I'm special. I wasn't a chosen one. You know, like Jesus was the chosen one. I wasn't like that. But by accident, I was experimented on by aliens. And when that happened... It was before there was any uh, cordless things. There was no cordless telephones. You know, there was no satellite dishes. You know, my, my, my TV had antennas on it. You know what I mean? And that was it. You know, telephones had a hard line. Uh, so there was no such thing as cordless, wireless, but yet, or computers. But yet I was contacted wirelessly 13 miles away. I know exactly where they were on this mountain in Lyle Creek by my house. And um, they tuned into my brain. I think is what they were doing. They randomly chose me and other people probably. And they just wanted to download what we knew as humans, like as if we were specimens, you know, like we take mice and we want to know what the fuck they think, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and as they were doing that, for some reason I woke up and caught them doing it. And because I did, I was aware to where most people, I think it happens. You don't even know could have happened to you and you just slept through it and you know, nothing. And they know everything that you know. <laughs> But in the, this case, because I caught him, my mind expanded for that one split second. I saw way into the future of technology and not know how to do it. But I saw possibilities and I saw, wow, there is. I looked up in the sky for the first time. And instead of just looking at stars and going, oh, isn't this beautiful? I'm going whoa, there's some shit going on here. So it, it inspired me, enlightened me, and it set me on a path to where my intuition took me to places like San Francisco. My intuition took me to the fortune teller's house, Miss Kellerman. Uh, my intuition took me into a bookstore and just happened to pull a book off the shelf and it was about numerology. Uh, you know, every, see here, I got goosebumps. I, can you see my arms? This is sad. I'm, I'm, I'm a dead giveaway. It's like, it's like having tears in your eyes and saying, no, I'm not crying. I am being touched right now. My, my fur, my skin is crawling like a goose um, because I'm just led to things because of that open mind is it opened my mind. They didn't open my mind. They didn't do shit. They was, they just did. But by catching them, it opened my mind. And once your mind is open, you know, 
that the yeah. things come in. So I really think it, that's changed how it changed my life, the way I go through life. And it's part of the way I can shortcut things. Um, when I wrote songs with Eddie Van Halen or when I write songs with Ronnie Montrose or Joe Satriani, whoever I write songs with, when I'm the lyricist uh, and when I'm doing a vocal, when I hear the music, you know, I walk into the room, Eddie plays on piano, uh, you know, love, you know, I don't know, how do I know when it's love? I just sing. I don't even have to think. I feel that music. I can sing along to him writing a song as if I've heard it a hundred times. And that's some kind of a gift. And when I go in to sing in a studio to sing a vocal track, I usually get it on the first or second try. And that's it. I just read my lyrics. I understand them. I remember them. I never use a teleprompter my whole life with every song. I could play a song tomorrow that, I've, that I haven't sang for 10 years and I can sing it. You just play the music, I'll sing it. And it's, that's a gift. And uh, I think it's from having open mind and I don't block information from coming in and I don't block information from going out. So yeah. mm -hmm. I shortcut everything. I get things done so fast. People, how the fuck do you get, Hey, how'd you do that? I'm going, I don't know. Fuck. I just did it. You know, <laughs> I can. So that helps me accomplish things too. You see what I'm saying? So when I think about starting yeah. a business, I go, Oh, here's all I got to do. I just got to bam, 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 bam. get on the phone, call up this guy, put that guy in charge. Bam, done. You know? And it's like, some people sit and plan everything, man. They write the shit down and they yeah. think about it and they redo it. Man, I don't do none of that. I don't step, think I've... Step by I've only step. <laughs> step by step. No. Yes, no, go I go straight. Bam. So I've, I've only written uh, about three songs in my life where I wrote the lyrics again and again and again. One of them was Mine All Mine. That song, you know, on the OU812 record. I love that song. But I could not write those fucking lyrics. I wrote them seven times. I stayed up to four o'clock in the morning writing over and over and changing this and changing that. Why? I don't know. But that's one song. And there's been a couple of other ones that I struggled like that. And um, but most of them, eh, 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 you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm well, listen, I'm gift. happy. As you say, it's, it's a gift. Yeah. And I'm not questioning it either, by the way. I'm going, how in the hell is it? No, never mind. Don't worry about it. You don't have time to worry yeah. about it. You'll start and thinking about okay. it. <laughs> yeah. Once again. <laughs> uh, we, we talk about uh, Van Halen, uh, uh, Sammy. And, and your, uh, in your book, I got the feeling that the, the big bag of shit in Van Halen band was Alex who is said to be a terrible guy to work with. In a certain way, uh, this situation showed that it's often better to choose a nice guy to play in your band than a, a technical perfectionist. Uh, was that the method of selection when you chose the guys to play with you in, uh, in the Waboritas and even in Chicken Foot and uh, in the circle? Well, the Waboritas for sure. When I left Van Halen, I said, I don't, I don't care if I ever do anything better than that because I probably won't. You know, Van Halen was so fucking good. You know, everything about it. You know, we had genius guitar player and him and his brother were so connected that they played so well together that Alice couldn't play that good with any other guitar player. And Eddie could play as good with another drummer, but he couldn't write a song and make it work the way him and Alex went like this. That was special. And then, of course, Michael Anthony, because he didn't ever care. He never said nothing. He never argued. He never, he just showed up. Ah, he's fast too, like me. He could learn a song. Eddie go, no, here's a rip. Michael, oh yeah, I got it. Got it. You know, Mike was like, wow, off to the races. And, and Alex and Ed would spend 24 hours on one song before Mike and I walked in the room because they, Alex was, they were really particular. So it worked, you know, they ironed out every little thing to where um, they didn't have to, they just chose to. I said, I never want to do that again. So I, when I joined the Wobblers, I just said, do I like this guy? He's a good guitar player, Vic Johnson. Do I like him? I like him. You got the job. You know, I, I spent a couple of days with him and said, I like him or don't like him. 
Uh, Vic Johnson happened to be a great choice because he's one of my favorite guitar players in the world. He's so fucking yeah. good. He he's can play anything. Good. He is fucking good. And his tone and his feeling it makes it look so easy. It looks like, Vic, is it hard for you to play that shit? He goes, oh, hell yeah. I'm going, you don't make it look like it's hard. But, uh, <clears throat> but with Chicken Foot, it was different. Uh, Joe Santriani is a complete anal perfectionist. When he shreds, he takes a solo where he's going and then he slows it down and takes every note. And he goes, oh, there was a bad note in there. I'm going, there was no fucking bad note. No one would ever hear that. No, no, he fixes it. He, he, he's another nut. I love him to death. He's probably the best guitar player in the world. And he's definitely one of the greatest uh, songwriters because Joe can write a song a minute to where Eddie struggled. Eddie would take him forever, you know, uh, for whatever reason. Joe, if I say, Joe, hey, let's write a song like Whole Lot of Love. Joe will come to me that night with a complete song with a riff. And I'd say, wow, that's kind of like it. But yeah, that's really cool. Uh, you know, he can he can just write out of the ether. He, he's, look at how many solo records he's made with instrumentals. So he has to write. He doesn't even have a lyrics to write. He just writes the melody on guitar. And he's really a genius. He a, a really, really a gifted guy and um, perfectionist. So, so Chicken Foot was different. Uh, Joe made us a perfectionist. Um, we made perfect records. But um, now with the circle, they're a half between. I got guys that are so good. Like Mikey's so fast. He's like me. You have to show him something once. He learns it. He remembers it. Jason Bonham can play drums to anything. He could play drums to a fucking parrot screaming in the, in the jungle and he'd put a fucking badass beat to it. So chicken foot um, was a little bit more like a Van Halen kind of thing, but the circle, man, we could, we blow it out. We've rehearsed three times, went on tour the first time years ago and made a record on the first tour. We made a live record that three live record time. three times. We rehearsed, we made a set nice. list. We can play this. We get on stage. We go, hey, uh, I tell Jason the night before, let's add uh, like on this last tour, let's add human beings. The song Van Halen wrote for the uh, Twister movie. I said, let's add human beings to the show. He said, OK, I'll listen to it tonight. And we get on stage. Sound check. Uh, 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 OK, what about the ending? Well, blah, 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 blah. OK, done. We go and play it that night. And it's fucking great. This band is unbelievable. They're my dream band because we don't have to rehearse. I hate to fucking rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> you know play, what I'm saying? <laughs> it's terrible. Play, play the same song over and over and oh, over. Oh, oh, my God. God. Do we have to play one way to rock at rehearsal? No, we don't. We uh, know that song, you know? So, uh, Sam, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Sam, what you... Uh, you, you have uh, the biggest guitarists with you always. You have Montrose, Satriani, Big, Eddie, and you are also a great guitar player. So how do you think that why you always choose to have a really good guitar player? Do you think, do you think that this is the success in a band? Is it magic? I think I'm a better singer than a guitar player. So if I try to sing and play guitar all the time, they suffer. Uh, I, I don't sing as good when I'm trying to play a hard part. So I prefer to have a guitar player with me, but he's got to be better than me. Otherwise, I, well, I have the guy, right? Because then I have to play the hard stuff. I need a guy that can play stuff that I can't play and sing. And that's the Neil Schoen, you know, Vic Johnson, yeah. Joe Santriani, right. Eddie Van Halen, Ronnie Montrose. Those are the guys. I learned it from Ronnie Montrose because I was a guitar player, singer, the lead guitar player when I, from my band when Ronnie discovered me. And he said, hey, you know, you don't have to play guitar. And I go, I want to play guitar. I go, I don't need a guitarist. I want to be like the who. I said, okay, fuck, you know, I'll just sing. This is Ronnie Montrose. He's famous, you know. And, and I learned how much better I sang <laughs> than when I was playing the, all the guitar parts, you know, and, and I kind of, I liked it. Then, then I liked it. And then when I left Montrose, I wanted to play guitar again. because I, Ronnie didn't want me to even touch a guitar. He didn't want me to even look at it. He didn't want people to think I even played guitar, you know, because he was real strict about being 
the guitar player, the bass player, the drummer, and the singer. That's it. You know, like the who, like Led Zeppelin, all the classics, you know? Yeah. So I said, uh, I, I went along with it, but I was really horny to play guitar again. Uh, but then when I started my, the band with Gary Peel, you know, and made all those records back then, I was like the lead guitarist and, you know, I shared the, the, the duties with Gary Peel. Um, but after a while, I realized I, I started performing when we start playing big places, start playing, you know, stadiums and arenas. I realized I'm better off without the guitar. So first I invented the headset mic, you know, the, 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 I was the first guy to use that. And then Peter Gabriel and then the yeah. rappers start doing it. But I used it because I didn't want to be strapped to a microphone. I wanted to perform for all those people. I said, how can I get to those people? I got to be running all over the place. So I did that. And then pretty soon I said that the headset mic sounds like shit. So when I play guitar, I'll use the real microphone with a cord, not even wireless. And then I will not play guitar in a lot of songs. And then when I start doing that again, it, I, I realize that I'm really a better front man when I don't play guitar all the time. But when I pick it up, I do like to shred and I stay practice. I practice. I got this Les Paul sitting here. I got guitars all over my house in every room and all my, everywhere I live, I have guitars, guitars, guitars. Um, and I play all the time. I play every day and I could get them little fingers going. And I speak one language. I used to tell Joe Satriani, you know, he, he used to tell me that I'm a good guitar player. I said, ah, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I said, I only speak one language, you know, that's it. I speak Sammy Hagar language, you know? And I said, you know, a guy like Joe Satriani, he can speak any language. <laughs> oh, that guy, yeah, Russian? Oh, yeah, I'll play that in Russian. You know, he, <laughs> he's, uh, that, that's, that's the difference between me and a real virtuoso. I'm like B.B. King. I'm the old blues guys. I can speak my language, you know. Right. So uh, uh, I got, I got a, a curious uh, uh, question, Sammy. You told about uh, New Chum, and in the first half of the 80s, you had a band with New Sean, with uh, uh, Kenny Arison, former uh, uh, Dust, bass player, and Michael Shreve, former drummer of Carlos Santana Band. It was AS, AS. and you recorded uh, 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 just a single album in 1984, Through the Fire, this album. Why this project didn't go ahead? The record didn't, send, uh, didn't sell well, Uh, a, a, a tour didn't happen. Uh, did you fight among the, uh, yourselves? What happened? You know, the chemistry was very strange in that band. Uh, it, it was a really fun band. Neil Schoen and I, we, we can write songs all day long. You know, we're, we're friends and we all, we're still great friends. And him and I had a chemistry, but finding other guys that worked in that chemistry, it was difficult. I, can't, I, I don't know what it is. Like, you know, Chicken Foot, We had all made it. So it was easy. Nobody needed money. We weren't doing it for money. We weren't doing it for fame and fortune. We were doing it for, strictly for the art. Well, Kenny Aronoff and, I mean, Ken, Kenny Aarons, uh, Aronson and, uh, and the drummer, you know, they had left been ba big bands, but they really didn't make any money. And Neil and I were kind of really starting to get big, you know, and so we had different motives. They, those guys, they really wanted to, Oh, let's go on tour. Oh, we got to do this. And oh, I got to be paid. Oh, I, you know, I need this much money. And it was just too, it was too much. We were too far apart. Neil and I were like very secure. And, and quite honestly, Journey was just about to explode, as you all know. And I was just about to explode with I Can't Drive 55, the VOA record. And so we kind of, Neil and I said, man, we can't go on tour with that. We can't make any money because it wasn't successful. So we'd have to pay these guys, you know, our money. And to keep them happy. So it, it, it really wasn't about money, but it was kind of about success and fame and fortune in everyone's lives at that time. And, and to this day, I give both those guys all the royalties I ever get from that record because it's it sold over the years. It's, it still makes a little money here and there, you know, and it's, you know, even if just a few hundred dollars every now and then now, but I send those guys the checks and, and I've never taken one penny from that band. Um, Because I loved that band. It was fun. I mean, those live shows, they were pretty interesting. The music Neil and I made. I just came back from a, a trip in um, Africa and, and through um, Europe. I went to Italy and Sardinia and then went all down through Africa, Egypt and Kenya. And for six weeks, it was my first big vacation I ever took in my life because I worked my whole life and I never took time off. 
And I came back with all these great lyrics. And on the way home, it's in the book, the story, you know this, that I got the speeding ticket because they changed the speed limit in America to 55 miles an hour while I was gone. So I was driving 62 and a guy gives me a ticket and I was angry. I just traveled 24 hours, man. I was saying, man, dude, I don't want to fucking sit here and have you write me a ticket for 62 miles an hour. I can't drive 55. Oh, hey, what a great song idea, right? A protest song, no less. Everyone thinks yeah. it was a, a gimmick. Yeah. It's a fucking protest song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, a, it's, a kind, it's a kind of Bob Dylan song. Yeah, uh, exactly. On the highway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, there you go. Perfect. Bob Dylan on the highway. So not Highway 61. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> highway, highway 238, I believe it was. So I, I, so I played I Can't Drive 55 for Neil. And he said, oh, dude, I thought we were going to write all these songs together. And I said, absolutely. I'm sorry. Not a, no problem. But, you know, this is a cool song. He goes, fucking great. But save that for your own shit, right? I'm going, okay. So because he wanted to write the music, I was going to write the lyrics. So I had all these lyrics, you know, Giza and, and Valley of the Kings and all these great lyrics from, from the trip. And we wrote the great songs of very spiritual, artsy, fartsy stuff. And then I write, I can't drive 55. My next record is the biggest hit I ever had. And if we would have did it up with HSAS, it'd have probably been a big hit. We might have <laughs> made it and kept going. But yeah. uh, I'm so glad that Neil said, no, man, dude, we have a we have an <laughs> agreement. I write the music, you write the lyrics. OK. It's it's a pretty funny story, but it's yeah. true. Now there, here we go again. The angel, the angel on my shoulder said, "No, no, no, Sammy, don't worry, keep that one." <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny. It's funny when you explain in the book about that. You say how now when you are because you like the velocity, right? I would dispute it, and when you find sometimes the policeman. Hey, 55, right. Go ahead, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, it's the way my life works. Uh, I don't think anything has ever happened to me that at the time I thought, this is really fucked up, like getting kicked out of Van Halen. You know, I got thrown out of that band. There's no question about it. I got thrown out of the band. I did not quit. I was uh, thinking about quitting because we weren't getting along, but I wasn't going to quit Van Halen, for God's sakes, you know. So... When they threw me out of the band, I was thinking, these motherfuckers, this is terrible. Oh, God, what did you do to me now? What did I ever do? You know, this is a, the worst thing that happened in my life. And it sure enough, it wasn't. You know what I mean? It, it was beautiful what happened to me since then. My life from that day on, well, from about six months later, it took about six months to finally make a record and, and get the wobbos. And I became the happiest guy in the world. And and spent more time with my passion in Mexico with the Cabo Wobble Cantina and making tequila and all those things. And it was like, God, it was like a, the angel saying, no, you've got to get thrown out. Shut up. Just, you know, don't listen to your, your insecurities. Don't listen to your ego saying, oh, my God, is, you know, this is going to ruin my life. You know, I don't know. I can't explain it. I, I was really hurt. And even that I look back now going, it's the greatest thing that ever happened. My angels got made that happen. They went and tapped Eddie and said, get rid of him. They were, they were tapping Eddie on the shoulder. My angels going, get rid of him. He's an asshole. Throw him out of the band. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, actually I, I, I was in Cabo Wabo twice. Once in the early uh, 90s. I think it was in the beginning. Um, and then I'm um, also I went one to when you have your birthday, the birthday party there. And also I drank your tequila is the best in the world. It's a shame that in Brazil it's difficult to get it, you know. It's the best tequila. I love Don Julio. I love Don Julio really. The, uh, uh, but uh, for me, the Cabo Wabo tequila is the fantastic one. I'm looking forward to go to America again to trying to find. Some bottles for me. Here's one you want. Santo. Santo tequila. That's my new one. Santo tequila. Wow. Santo. This it's is called... Santo. Is it, the Santo tequila is the one you are selling now in your shows? Yes. And I'm selling it all over America. And hopefully they'll, someday you'll be able to get it. In, we, you can get it in Mexico. We have it at the Cabo Wabo now. Cabo Wabo tequila was the best at the time. It was absolutely the best. Was. Campari bought, okay. when they bought the tequila from me, they went to another distill. I didn't own the distillery. I had a place called El Vejito. Juan Eduardo made this tequila for us, and he was the best. 
But then he got in trouble. That's in the very beginning, in the old blue bottle. He got in trouble with the government. He wasn't paying taxes and they confiscated his business. So I had to switch to someone else. And the next version of Cabo Wabo tequila was really good, too, because back then there wasn't any real good tequila, but it, it was good. And it still is good. But then when they bought it, they moved to uh, uh, Espelon. They bought the distillery and they make Cabo Wabo there now, which is still good. But I went back with Santo to Juan Eduardo, and he has another small distillery now, and he makes this tequila exactly like the old original, the very first Cabo Wabo, when it was in the hand bone blue bottles. And the reason I went back to him, because he cooks the agave twice. Everyone else cooks it once, and you know, all night, 12 hours. Mm -hmm. He cooks it all night, leaves it rest all night, and then cooks it again all night, leaves it rest again all night, and then gently squeezes the juice out. Oh man, no bitterness. It gets sweeter. It's more caramelized. It's just yeah, excellent. So that's the way we make yes. Santo now again. But and Santo is so so Santo is doing the same city that means that you be the, the first the first Cabo Wabo? The first Cabo Wabo years ago, like probably wow. the first time you tasted it. And you know, I'm I really love tequila and, and I make rum too, and I make rum the same way. We we make it a little bit. It, my rum tastes a little more sweeter and a little bit more caramelized. People think, oh, you must put sugar in it. No, no, no. It's because you cook it twice. I learned it from, from one guy. But it's, it's more expensive to do that. So a lot of people don't do it because everybody's trying to make money. I don't, it's not the way I make money. I made money that way by accident, but it wasn't how I make money. You know, it's, <laughs> so it, when, you, when you can afford to do something and not cut any corners, I just say to my distiller, I want to make the best tequila in the world. Make it. And he tells me how to do it. So, well, amazing. Wow. Is, just, just asking, that city, is it the same city of Tequila or next to Tequila City, next to Guadalajara? Oh, oh it's Guadalajara. It's by Guadalajara. It's Jalisco. It's in the mountains, yes. 45 minutes uh, outside of Guadalajara at about 3,000 feet elevation. So it's nice, wow. perfect weather. It just gets a little more rain because, you know, agave, they don't water it. It's, it's wild. And if, if you water it, eh, it's not the same, you know, so you need to, it has to be, it has to fight for its life, and that's why it's so good. It's got soul. It's a spirit. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it fights for its life. And, and uh, if, so it's that elevation it gets just enough rain uh, so that it has to be tough and fight, but it doesn't have such a hard life that it doesn't taste good. <laughs> <laughs> you know totally. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a fighter, a good fighter. He can't be rich. He's got to be hungry, man. And he works his way up. As soon yeah. as he gets rich, he gets knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, uh, talk about money. Uh, uh, I spent I spent my money in your records since since the seventies. Because oh, wow. uh, here in Brazil, the first time uh, uh, we hear, uh, we heard about you was when the album Musical Chef was released in 1977 here in Brazil. And, wow! And if if my mom if my memory if my memory serves uh, serves me correctly, Montrose's first two albums didn't did not come uh, out here. I like it so much this album that later I went to an uh, imported record shop and bought the self title LP from the 77. And that's my favorite. That's my favorite old of the old this that one record. That's yeah. a, that's a, that's a good record. I like it. Yeah. Why? I just think my art, my songwriting and the production of that record elevated from my first ones. Musical chairs is good, but then I, I don't know why, but I wrote some silly songs on musical chairs, you know, like I forget which ones, but there's a couple pretty lightweight and the production was all over the place because my producer, I wanted to produce that record and my record company made the producer do it and we didn't get along. So a lot of things went wrong, but the red album, that, that, that's, that's, it was done at Abbey road, you know, come on. And that's <laughs> got rock and roll weekend. It's got red. It's got, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. free money. Uh, oh, class. Catch the wind. I mean, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Cruising so, and boozing. <laughs> so, uh, Sammy, listen to these records and now the older uh, and now the others from his career. <laughs> God bless you, brother. And, and I have them all. 
Uh, and listen to these records is still a very cool experience. Uh, you, you, because your albums have uh, uh, Asian very well. Uh, it's, just, it's just that today you can listen to everything with a click on your mobile phone because of streaming service with a horrible, horrible and compressed sound. Do you still enjoy listening to records in their original editions uh, with that wonderful analogic sound? Or do you no longer care about that and have become a customer of iPhones, streaming servers, and other shit? Well, I must admit, I am a victim of... Um, Alexa and you know that little machine that you, can, uh, yeah. you can tell it what to play so you don't have to go over to a record player I'm busy I'm cooking I'm mixing a drink hey Alexa you know play uh, you know John Cougar's Mellencamp uh, fucking Nick, Jack and Diane you know whatever but <laughs> when someone comes out with a new record any one of my favorite artists I buy the whole CD I buy vinyl if it's available and I play the whole fucking record from top to bottom and i don't even play one song until i have time to do that you know like i told you know uh, billy gibbons with the last zz top record well his, his last solo record even yeah um, amazing. you know he amazing yeah, album. Oh, I, uh, amazing I know. Album. It, it, it's 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 as good as it's like the greatest hits of zz tops that you never heard <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> but, it's true, so, it's true. Yeah. we we so, just interviewed him last last week we talked with him and he, uh, he's so sweet. I'm um, amazing. Uh, wow. He's intelligent and he's so fucking weird. He's so interesting. I, he blows my mind whenever I talk to him. Uh, but he sends me a, you know, a text and said, hey, here's my new CD, man, uh, Red Rocker. I want to see what you think. And, uh, and I say, Billy, I'm not going to listen to this until I have time to sit down with no interruption and listen to the whole fucking thing. And he appreciates it. Mellencamp, my, my friend John, the reason I said to him, I, I'm a big fan because he changes every record. I say, John, why don't you, you know, write those songs like, you know, Hurt So Good and Jack and Diane. He goes, fuck those songs, man. I don't even like playing those songs. I'm going, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know, he's always trying to, you know, push himself <laughs> to do something different. And I love him for it, though. And so I'm always interested in what he's going to do. So when he puts out a new record, same thing. I put the whole thing on. I listen to the whole thing from head to toe. And then if I have certain songs I like, then I ask Alexis to play it for me. <laughs> so I'm kind of the best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't listen to my own stuff. <clears throat> I got to tell no. you. No, I don't. I, not because I just like it. I just don't. I, it's almost embarrassing to me in my house with my kids and my wife to sit there and play Sammy Hagar. Uh, you know, I'll go pick up a guitar <laughs> and I'll sing them a song in the living room. You know, I'll say, hey, what song you want to hear? And, you know, I'll play, I'll play it for you right here. But um, uh, it, except my last record with The Circle, when, when we did Space Between, I listened to, I listened to that over and over. And I kind of slaved on it like I don't like to do. And I changed the lyric here and there. I go back and I re-sing one part of the song. I say, you know, it looks, I don't sound confident enough in that one spot. Uh, chorus. I'm going to re-sing that chorus. I really picked it apart because I wanted it to be great. And, and I know it, greatness does come with work. And um, I don't like to work. <laughs> but I work. <laughs> so what the fuck's wrong with me? But, uh, so that record, I did listen to that record a lot because I kept changing the running order. I, you know, I have seen well, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Because it was a concept, I had to make sure that it flowed. And um, I spent a lot of time listening to that record. And, and I love that record. I'll tell you right now, not because it's my last record, not because it's my only number one record on, as a solo artist. It's because it's fucking deep and it's good. It's my favorite record. I mean, I, I, I'm so proud of that record. Say, well, if you listen to one Sammy Hagar record, mm, I'd say there's no such thing. But if there has to be that way, just listen to the latest one because that is who Sammy Hagar is today. And I don't change. I change, but I don't lose what I, my soul. So I still have the same yeah. soul I had in Montrose today. Yeah. And so you can listen to my newest thing and you'll hear it. Same guy, same fucking guy. Just got yeah, better. Sure. He got smarter, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, but I, we, we can list a connection between 
uh, your work on the first Montrose album and the new one. That's that's yeah, a con yeah. that's a connection. Yeah, that's co yeah. Sure. I yeah. say <laughs> you don't ever. <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, sorry. I'll never lose my thought. I know exactly what I want to say. Okay, I'll say. No, if uh, you, <laughs> if you, if you, <laughs> I believe <clears throat> that when I talked about dreams, how you chase a dream and you leave the other ones behind. No. You, if you came from nothing and you keep one finger on that your whole life, which is me, I came from nothing, that everything you become on the way and everything you accomplish, and then you're here, then if you don't lose sight and, and if you don't lose touch on who you are in the beginning and who you were, then you will be this big. You'll be, the, you know, this big, is big like this, to where if you say you're ashamed of, of your past being poor or making a bad record or not being a good singer when you first started, if you're ashamed of all that and you let it go, then you're, and you're here, you're only this big now. See, then now you're here and you left all this behind. This stuff is important for your soul. Every time I open my mouth to sing, You're going to hear that little fucking hungry guy that was in Montrose screaming his guts out on Bad Motor Scooter and Space Station Number Five. You're going to hear, um, you're going to hear that guy today, and I think that's important. Yeah. A lot of people don't do that, you know. I'm sorry, but they don't. You know, yeah. some we, do. So. We, do, we talk about uh, uh, feel no shame. I got a question to you, my my dear friend. What's your favorite album? that you feel embarrassed to listen to and to oh, admit that you love oh, the, the first Montrose record. Absolutely. I love that record. I love that but, record. But, 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 but you but feel embarrassed. embarrassed. But if you embarrassed to, to admit you love it. Oh, yeah. But that's the, the, it makes me cringe because I was struggling. I wanted it so bad. I was screaming. I, was, I, I could have been singing about fucking cat food. I could have been singing about eating dog shit and it sounded like I was so passionate that I, I was so in love that when I'm screaming, get on your bad motor scooter and ride like I mean it from the bottom of my heart because I did. It's kind of embarrassing to be young and, and silly like that, you know, to, but I love that little guy. I love that guy. That's my that's my little little guy. Uh, what do you call him? He's like my child within my inner child. That's him, um, you know, like. I, uh, yeah, no, that record gives me, gives me cringes. I go, Oh God, you know, don't be so <laughs> serious, you know, <laughs> but, but then at the same time, I'm going, wow, that is fucking full of fire. That song, that record is, is fire, man. Yeah. yeah. Love it too. Love it too. Yeah. Um, tell me is son, the difference between you and David Lee Roth, It's enormous. It's enormous. Enormous. I can imagine, I can imagine you thinking, well, I have to join the uh, Van Halen. I like that band, but I know looks like David Roth. <laughs> he's a real, How he's a real character. That? He's a showman. He's all you show. Guys, you he guys, just, you guys, you Two guys from different planets. Oh man, different planets. I, I I enjoy him, but you talk about cringing. I can't imagine how he feels when he looks at some of them old videos, the way he was dancing and moving, and and the way he was singing live. Sometimes I don't know how he feels about all that, but I don't think he cares. The difference between him and I is I sincerely care. I care about everything I do and I care how it affects people and I care, I care what they think. Uh, I care that it touches them and makes them happy. And what is important to me is enlightening and elevating people spiritually and making them happy, making them uh, have good dreams, making them um, want to be better themselves. That's my goal with everything I do is to, to bring that to people and um, change their life if I can. And I don't think he could, he cares about anything like that. I don't, and, and that's the difference between our presence. Um, he's very much into himself, very much into, you know, being a showman and doesn't really care. Uh, I, I don't know what he cares about. I really don't. I don't know him. I have no idea who that guy is. I don't think anyone does. And, uh, but he, he, uh, he entertains me. 
I, I, I enjoy watching him do stupid shit, you know. Uh, <laughs> I try to. What, 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 what do you really think when you see a TV and you see him? <laughs> what is coming in your mind? You laugh, you, what do you do? Well, the first thing I'd say is I look at him and I think, wow, he's a strange person. He's a strange character. He's. He's not what he's saying he is. He's pretending. He's totally bullshit. Everything he does is thought up, and it's an image. It's nothing to do with who he is. He is not exposing who and what he is. And I know this for a fact, but when I see him, I knew that the first time I saw him, I said, oh, this guy, he's, put, he's putting on an image, putting on a show. You know, he goes back home and goes in his house and whole different guy. <laughs> it has nothing yeah. to do with that guy. Um, he's not honest about his image and his performance. That's what I see when I see him. That's, that's how I feel. But I tried to be friends. When we did our tour together, I thought it was going to be so much fun. I thought if he's anything like he claims to be, oh, we're going to have a good time. But he wasn't. <laughs> he was the worst guy to be around. He, he wasn't ever around. He hides out. He, you know, you never see him. He fucking, you know, he puts on his whole big front and comes out and oh, I'm here. David Lee Roth is here. And then he goes and hides again. You know, it's like very, very strange. Um, I don't think he's happy. You know, he's never been married, never had a relationship, never had children. You know, it's like, yeah, how do you live like that? I, I don't know. I'm a family man, you know, it's so, I, it's so, and I it's love so women. It's so I love women and me. children. It's so <laughs> sad to me to see, to see him. It's so sad. He's, uh, he hasn't aged well, his voice. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard. Uh, I used to not want to cause trouble. First, I, in the old days, before I was in Van Halen, I ripped him through the fucking coals when I do the press before I ever was in that band. And then when I joined the band, I tried to be nice. And then when I left the band, I tried to be nice about him. Uh, and then we did our tour together. And then I fucking said, fuck this guy again. Right. He's an asshole. You can't get along with him. He's no fun. He's full of shit. And then now After Eddie's death again, I feel once again, he's part of the Van Halen legacy and he's important. So I wouldn't want to <clears throat> ruin anything to do with what he brought to that legacy. Van Halen, I want Van Halen to be go down as one of the greatest rock bands of all time. Rock bands. I don't know whether band you call us whatever you want, but not just mine, Dave's era. I want it all to be. I want Eddie to be the legend and get the respect that he deserves. And the only way to preserve that is by being kind about the past. And yeah. uh, like in my book, like I said, that's the only thing I would probably mm -hmm. soften it up uh, and, and put, but it's too late. It, it, it is what it is. And it's honest. So I'm not lying. I'm not backpedaling. Nope. Nope. It's all true. But uh, God rest his soul. He's a, uh, he brought a lot to this planet, to this business yeah. of rock and roll. Eddie Van Halen did. And Dave was part of it. No, it's yeah. too bad. Yeah. It's too bad what he's become. <laughs> But uh, that's different. That's not Van Halen anymore. You know. Yeah. No, it's true. Paulo, do you have any 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 questions to to Sammy? My last my last one. Uh, well, like actually, two last one. Just just. Oh, uh, just <laughs> I'm joking. Come on, bring it. I'm so far. Uh, come on, I'm big fan. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Hey, one is uh, about you. You looks really very spiritual guy. Um, also in everything, you like to, to, to wear your to breath always. Um, and you are always taking care of a, a lot about God. Actually, you finished your book talking about that. To believe in God, to the family and everything. Uh, that was from the beginning of your, of your career or two became that guy that is spiritual guy oh uh, i think when i was a child when i was really young i prayed i always prayed when i went to bed at night uh because i had a, a horrible family life my father was an alcoholic and my mother was a hard-working wonderful woman and my dad was a wonderful man he just had a real problem and he when he drank he beat people up not kids he didn't beat me up he didn't beat a, he never touched his kids he had beat my mom up though And he would beat the neighbors up and he'd beat the police up when somebody would call the police. He would come to the house to get him and he'd beat them up. He, he was a badass, you know. And so I would pray at night that, you know, things would work out and my mom and dad would work it out and, and, uh, and get it together. And I think I believe in prayer. And then um, 
I wasn't, I didn't go, you know, I went to church I mean, as a cat raised a Catholic and, and I went and got communion and all that baptized, but I don't practice that kind of religion, but I believe in the power of prayer. And, um, it's when I read Mahatma Gandhi's book years ago, his autobiography, he's out of the whole book that was this thick. He said, Western man does not know and realize the power of prayer. And I thought, yeah, I do. And I have since I was a kid and it resonated deep within me. And when, when that finally came to be my band, we pray before every show, but we don't ask for anything. My prayer is, I want to thank God for the <sighs> I want to thank God for the love and the light for allowing the love and the light to pass through us and touch all those we come into contact with. I want to thank God for the opportunity to bring love and joy to all these people here tonight and for the ability to do a perfect job. That's my prayer and I wrote that. And uh, I say it every night with my whole band we huddle up and if I there's been two or three times that I forgot the prayer before I went on stage and I got on stage and I fucking freaked out. It'd be like, I'm going, Oh shit, something's going to go wrong. You know, <laughs> I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of believe in all that shit, you know? And so, um, uh, and they didn't, but I did have a couple tough shows those times. Thing, Cause I was off my, my timing. I was thinking, shit, I, and so instead of being there, I was thinking, damn it, I should have done it. So my point is, is that that prayer gives me security and my band feels it. And we go out on stage and we, we play good every night, you know, unless someone's really sick. But um, so I think through life, I become more and more spiritual because I believe in helping people. And I believe uh, that all mankind should do this, you know, that you should help your brother, your sisters. I just believe it innately. You know, it's not it's not something I've read. Um, but I do believe that if people don't believe in God, if they don't have something they believe in and with a little bit of fear of maybe the devil or, or a bad, a hell that you won't be as kind as you go through life. So for me, I'm happy to say, no, I'm a dumb guy. I believe in God. And I believe that everyone should believe in God and that we're all connected. No one's better than anyone. Uh, that's why I named the band, the circle, the circle means no one's in above you below you, in front of you, or in back of you. You're all equal in a circle. And, uh, and I think that's a good way to go through life and stay humble. And, and if everyone believed in God, there wouldn't be so much bad shit in this world. So, so I believe in God, and I hope everyone else does. And I, I preach it. I don't preach it like, like a preacher, but I mean, I, I'm not afraid to say I believe in God, and I'm not afraid to say to you that came from God, and you are God, yeah. and I am God. You are God. We're all God, and we're all equal. I think that's a very important uh, way to go through life. So that's my job. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, uh, my last one of the now, Reyes, is Chicken Foot will be doing something else. Absolutely. You, you all... I don't know when. when. <laughs> I don't know when. Joe's, Joe won't do anything because of the pandemic. I asked Joe to do something this year, and he said, I ain't fucking doing it. I'm not going in front of no people. I'm not going out of no guy. Oh, easy, Joe. Joe's a fanatic, man. He's, <laughs> he's a real character. He's what I call passive aggressive. It's like, Joe, you say anything to him. He goes, oh, sure. You know, oh, what do you want to do? Oh, yeah, I'm okay. Oh, yeah. And then you say, hey, Joe, let's uh, dress up like women and go out on stage. Fuck you. I ain't doing that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, seems, he seems like he's easy going. He's not. But uh, he won't play. So. Hopefully when he gets over that, I'm sure the chili peppers are going to be fucking going out again for They go out for five years at a time. Me and Mikey would sacrifice a little bit of time with the circle to do a chicken foot reunion. I'm, I'm announcing, uh, I announce, I'm an announcing Monday, my residency in Las Vegas. I'm going to do it. It's a strat. It's a small 800 seat room. It's gorgeous, perfectly lined up where every seat is beautiful. Every area is, is elevated. So that you can see, And um, I'm going to be bringing different bands in there. We're, 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 we're starting um, the, last two, the last Friday and Saturday of, of October and the first Friday and Saturday of November. So we're just doing four nights to start with, then taking the, uh, the holidays off. Next year, we'll be doing maybe 50 shows a year there. And I plan on using all my different bands for different nights. Some nights I'll have the Wobbles. Some nice. nights I have Chicken Foot. Some night, you know. So Chicken Foot's going to be by hook or crook. We're going to be doing that. And if we do, we'll probably end up writing some songs together. I love chicken foot, but 
we <laughs> chicken foot is like it's 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 art that we don't joe won't play none of uh, i wanted originally chicken foot to be like the circle i got to tell you this i wanted to play two chili pepper songs two sammy hagar songs two joe satriani instrumentals right and two van halen songs joe would have no part of it <laughs> <laughs> He's an uppity prick. I'm telling you, I, I love him to death. Um, he, he's, he's one of the most intelligent people I know. So if he says, no, that's a stupid idea, it's hard to argue with him. <laughs> he, he's so fucking smart, you know. <laughs> so, Samit, thank you so much. Uh, you're really uh, one of the nicest guys in the show business. And for all the people that watching this Uh, uh, interview. Remember, I can drive 65 is a, pro, <laughs> is a protest song that Bobby Dylan would write if he would like best car. <laughs> <laughs> but he loves bicycles. But he loves bicycles. I yeah. do love bicycles. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I love the beach. Beach. It's, it's not really... the same thing. It's not the <laughs> same <laughs> thing. No, I you, love a lot of things. You, I, you, I, you love bicycles, but probably you like 65 <laughs> and not 55. I love Thank a you. lot of things. Trust me, there's a lot of things I love. Now, okay, I'll say, signing off, I'll give you one thing. Stand up and shout! Yeah. Bum, 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 bum. Peace. <laughs> we'll see you guys. Adios, Thank amigos. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Adios, How do I get amigos. on this fucking thing? <laughs> and helps to you and to your family. Peace to you, too. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, bye. God bless you. Meus amigos e minhas amigas, acabamos, vocês acabaram de assistir mais um dos papos de boteco que a gente leva aqui, absolutamente sensacionais, com um dos caras mais legais do planeta, que é o Sammy Hager. Espero que você tenha aprendido muita coisa aqui com, com aquilo que eu e o Paulo nós conversamos. Não esqueça de fazer a sua inscrição aqui no canal, você já sabe muito bem, visitar a nossa loja, que tem uns produtos muito legais, umas camisetas muito legais como essa aqui, ó. É, então, não esqueça também de adquirir o livro do Paulo Barão, Rock on My Dreams, que tem umas histórias sensacionais. Paulo, muito obrigado, valeu. Quero também agradecer ao Rodrigo Bart, que está sempre aqui nos, na, na parte técnica aqui, e também o nosso querido Nicolas. É, não esqueci, não. Valeu, tchau. Se você me permite, um, eu queria dedicar esse programa a meu querido amigo... Luiz Renato, que hoje ele passou a outro mundo, um momento bem delicado para mim, e só que eu não poderia também de ter passado a fazer essa entrevista, para mim importava muito. Então, quero dedicar esse programa no dia de hoje para a família do Luiz Renato, tá? e obrigado. É isso. Tchau, pessoal. Fiquem bem. Saúde para você, para sua família e para seus amigos. Tchau.